He came to America for religious asylum and to warn the church about coming persecution. Instead, he ended up in an American jail for a year. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Hey friends, what you're about to hear today on the broadcast will shock you, will dismay you, will you'll wonder, is there more to the story? Well, the more to the story is there's a spiritual battle going on, and you're going to hear about it firsthand. Michael Brown, welcome to the broadcast. I will not be taking calls today. This is a watershed interview with a man of God who has spent a year plus in an American prison. He is now out of jail now. Uh, he's in a foreign country, and you're going to hear his story firsthand today. I'm speaking about Torben Sundergaard, founder of The Last Reformation. Here he is, a Christian in Denmark, and has kind of a rediscovery of New Testament Christianity and starts living it out, and a movement is birthed that's gone around the world. And he faced such severe opposition in Denmark that he came to America for religious asylum. Torben, uh, so glad to have you with us. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's so good to be out. <laughs> and it's good to be here. Uh, um, amazing. All right, so listen, uh, there's so much we want to talk about. We want to talk about a message that you had for the American church about coming persecution before you were put in jail. We want to talk about what the Lord did in your life in jail. But first, let's recount the journey. Now, I know there are legal cases, asylum cases, different things going on. We can't talk about everything. But whatever we can talk about, we're going to talk about. Give us just a very brief picture of what was happening in Denmark and why you came to America for religious asylum. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been doing ministry in Denmark and all over the world for many years. And, and like everyone else, I've experienced opposition, uh, people on YouTube telling lies. And I think every ministry have experienced that. But what happened was that uh, back in uh, 2017-18, Danish TV started to follow me and do a documentary about me. Or I thought it was about me. And I've been doing TV before, and I've never had like any issues like that. And I want to say I was proud of being Danish. I had my Danish passport, the best passport in the world, I felt like. So I was free to travel and, and do a lot of things. But, but when they followed me and uh, started to show the programs, it was very, very different than what I've been told. Uh, they put me in box with some other ministries who had gone really wrong and, and mixed it all together. And I saw not only my name was really put in a very bad light, not only I was accused for many things I haven't done. Uh, for example, um, there was a Danish pastor who had had some issues and had been in jail for sexual misuse of minors. And they put him together in the show with me and mixed it all together mm. in a way that I was only accused of it almost. Like people send me threats mail, you have to go to jail again. I'm like, no, I have not been in jail. That was that guy. So it was a lot of mix. But there was an agenda behind it. And that was the most scary thing. I was supposed to be on national TV three times during January 2019. But I actually ended up being on national TV 17 times during January mm. because the day before the program, they talked about it. When the program aired, they talked about it. I was in the news uh, the same evening and the day after. And, and it was all agenda to put me and Christians in very, very bad light. And, and the program was actually called God's Best children <laughs> and it was a way to just say is this the best god has wow and then it was mixed and manipulated there was a lot of focus on deliverance and and they never showed the joy 
for my deliverance. Then they were short, the, like excitement, like, yeah, somebody got set free. The, they only showed the, the, weird, the, the manifestations. Mm-hmm. And then they, they changed the sound to make it even more scary. And then they put pictures of kids in that very often was not in the same room and somehow said, look, those kids are being traumatized because of what they're watching. And, and one of the child they used a lot, even in the trailer, was a young boy, I, I don't know how old, 18 years old, who was standing uh, with his trousers down and uh, in only underwear. And, and they said, look, he have, he have been traumatized, so he appeared in his pants. Huh. And, and it was what, what the story was about. Like, look at kids, look at this young boy, he was traumatized. He was so afraid of what he saw that he had been peeing in his pants and we need laws to deal with that. And, and the story behind that boy was he did not pee in his pain. He, he was a young boy who had autism and there was baptism going on at that time. And he saw the pool and he took his clothes off because he wanted to swim with the other people who was being <laughs> baptized. And the mom said no. And he started to cry and TV recorded it and it became a big Unreal. story in Denmark. Unreal. Yeah. And the persecution was just so weird and so hard. So I actually ended up uh, leaving. Uh, I got a phone call where I really understood this, this is not going to stop. And, and was, the, it, was there, are, there even family or, or one of your children? Yeah. 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 There was. Um, the government started to come in and, and, and talk, wanted to talk with my girls. And we are doing homeschooling and and homeschooling is not a common thing in denmark at all yeah yeah uh, so at that time there was only 400 kids in the whole country um but it was good for us because we were traveling a lot and and that was also weird first they came the way way it happened was that it made no nothing makes sense for example we had a training school and in the training school, we took at one time, we went on a man trip. We took all the mans, men, all the boys. We walked 10 miles. We slept outside. We have a guitar with us. We are worshiping God. And we also ate some food. And the food we ate was chickens we have with us. And we killed the chicken and we ate the food and it was a man trip. And and after we did that, uh, a few days later, um, the government came and knocked the door and said, they want to talk with my girls. And I said, why? And I said, because you are on a man trip and you slaughter some chicken. And I was like, but it's not illegal to slaughter chicken. This is how we get our food. <laughs> like, like uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but we still need to talk with your girls. But it was a man trip. My girls was not on the trip. No, but we still need to talk with that, your girls. Amazing. And, and it was like that. It, it was like that. And, and then they talked with them. And, and then as soon as they went out, it was like, no, we need to come back and talk. We think your daughter have an eating disorder. And like nothing makes sense. It was just like they tried to find something. And with all the TV in the programs with me, just after every program, we saw the politicians seeing clips taking out of context and say, we need the police to investigate this guy. We need laws. We need rule laws that can deal with those things. And in the mindset of the Danish people, I was already guilty. That was how I felt it. I felt like yeah. there's an agenda, agenda here and they want to get rid of me. Um, so we left for America. And, and when you came to America, though, Torben, and we've got uh, two minutes before our first break, on the one hand, you came for religious asylum. But did you also feel, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll pick this up more, but did you also feel that you had a warning for the church in America? America? Yeah. Yeah, I can say that short. Um, again, I was in shock. How could this happen? And, and, and on the way to America, I, I felt very strong. God said to me, 
that what you experience is coming to America, but my people are not ready for it. Mm. And I've called you to America to help to make, make my people ready for what is coming. All right. So a sense of the attack you came under. And, and folks, you understand, even though Denmark, the vast majority of the people are members of the state church, so church and state very much joined together in that regard. The vast majority of the people joined to the state church, only a very, very small percentage would be evangelical believing Christians. And then a very, very small percentage of that would be Pentecostal and charismatic. So everything that Torben was doing was very much rocking the boat. And, and Torben, you had been to America before. Did you ever have any problems being in the country here and ministering freely? No, no, not not at all. Uh, everything have always been good, and and uh, but you know when when I came to America, we uh, different things happened. Um, I actually didn't want to seek asylum in the beginning because I I hope it would go away <laughs> in Denmark, but a law was passed, a mental violence law, and and they they just many things happened, and I just knew that this is not going to to stop here. Um, so we we sought asylum and sent in the papers and and we thought everything was good. Uh, we are in America, <laughs> but uh, <sighs> but America is changing. America is changing, and and we saw that um, we came in 2019, and uh, short after we came, we got a training school, and it was at the same time we had the whole COVID thing, and after that there was the election, and. Because of what I already gone through in in Denmark, I recognized that spirit. Like right away when when I saw the American news, I haven't seen a lot of American news before I came here, and when I saw the election, I just like, this is the same spirit. This this is this this is this antichrist spirit. This this is exactly what I experienced in Denmark. And, and and I really saw through it all right away because it was like I've just gone through it uh -huh. and I recognized the same spirit in America in a, on a much bigger level because now it's not small Denmark. Now we are talking about America. Yeah. All right, friends, we will be right back because here Torben and his family come to America to seek religious asylum. You heard what happened in Denmark, the crazy accusations. The, what you're about to hear, you're gonna say there's more to, friends, what you're about to hear, every word of it is true. I was involved in the court case. I've spoken with the lawyers. You'll be shocked by what you hear happened in America. This is Michael Ellison, founder of Trivita Wellness. I want you to hear an amazing testimony from my friend, James Robison, and most all of you will know of him. He and his wife, Betty, host the Life Today television program. Now, here is James. Let me tell you about a miracle I experienced. My friend, Michael Ellison, he and his wife are our 40-year-plus best friends. Well, let me just say this to you. I had so much pain with what was called tennis elbow that I could hardly reach over and pick up the phone without pain, without it hurting me. I couldn't pick up something to drink, a glass of tea or anything. It was very difficult to do anything without wearing a tight strap. And then Michael shared the Nopal cactus juice with me, Nopalea. I began drinking about that much in the morning in a glass and that much later in the day. And in three months, I was a different person. I have now gone more than 10 years with no pain. Not better, well, I have no joint pain. I'm telling you, it did something to the inflammation in my body that was undeniable. Now, that's just my testimony. But that's been more than 10 years with no pain. Matter of fact, if I miss, for some foolish reason, a few days, I can feel it creeping back that fast. So give it a try. See if it helps relieve your pain. I hope it does like it has mine because it worked for me. No Pelea is supported by clinical studies for lowering inflammation and improving mobility, flexibility, and range of motion in the neck, back, and joints for less reliance on pain medication and improved quality of life. Call 800-771-5584 and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order goes to support the line of fire. 
Call 800-771-5584 or go online to Trivita.com. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back to the Line of Fire, friends. We are on the front lines for such a time as this. We have been sounding the alarm for many years for such a time as this. As God is pouring out his spirit, as resistance keeps rising, the church must rise up not in a carnal way, not fighting with fleshly, earthly weapons, but in the power and life of the Spirit with grace and truth together. This is the moment, and the opposition is heating up because God is moving more and more. My guest, Torben Sundergaard, founder of The Last Reformation, now in Europe, once he was released from prison in America. So he's here in America. He puts in paperwork to... Uh, make a plea for religious asylum because he and his family uh, do feel that they would be threatened there in Denmark, that there could be real legal persecution and social harassment and things like that. Next thing I hear, did you hear? And, and Torben and I got to know each other. He came to our offices here in North Carolina. We, we spent a couple hours together. We prayed together. I remember getting on our knees and crying out to God together. Yeah. Grads from our ministry school have worked with Torben in his ministry and so I, I saw his heart, his passion for the things of God, and his willingness to just obey and the favor that, that was on him. Next thing I hear, he's in prison. He's, he's in prison in America. All right, so, so Torben, again, we could talk for hours. There's so much that happened. But let's, let's yeah. give the, the terrible highlights of what happens when you are called in uh, by the government. You can give whatever details you're allowed to give, yeah. right? You're called in. Yeah. What? The, how? Why did they put you in jail? It is so crazy. Um, first, when when you seek asylum in America, it can normally take two, three, four, five years actually, and then you're being called into a asylum into you. But but nothing was normal here. Uh, after a little more than three years, I got a letter from Homeland Security in Orlando. Uh, I, I came from Orlando, but we live in California now. And they wanted to see me at a meeting. And first I thought, yeah, this is the asylum asylum interview. Now we can finally get the asylum and get our papers. Uh-huh. But when my lawyer saw that letter, she said, what is this? Like there's red flags, there's something off. Mm. And, and she noticed that the email was actually sent from my FBI task force. And she was like, Tom, I, I don't think you should go. There's something off, <laughs> or something like that. And I was like, I've got nothing wrong. Like, like everything is good. So I, I actually jumped in a plane and flew to Orlando, and, and I went to that meeting. And um, they, I came in, and they showed me, uh, I think, FBI's uh, bats. And then two people took me in at the office. And the, the, the papers just said they want to talk to me about my asylum case. There was no information about it. And then they start to talk. And he started to ask a lot of questions about, like, my money, where I get my money for, from. And I, I told I, I get salary and, and I pay tax and everything is in order. And he asked me a lot of questions and, and it was a little weird. And then he said, yes, uh, we have been told that you are smuggling weapons from Mexico to America. I mean, it's, it's hard not and, to burst I out. Like, I mean, I heard that. Torben's in jail yeah. for smuggling weapons from America. It's, it's like, what what in the world are you talking? I mean, who would even think we, of coming up with that? So this really happened. We, this we really just, happened. I live, I, I, yeah, I live in California, in San Diego now, and we had a Bible school in Mexico. So we, of course, have people going in and out because we have Bible school in America and in Mexico. Uh, but when they told me that, to be honest, I was, my first thought was, oh, I was relieved almost. Like, is it just, is that the lie now? Because in Denmark also, I was, I was accused of so many crazy things, but I thought this is too crazy. Like this is so insane. So no one will believe it. Yep, so yep. so I I thought I was okay. And then he said, but um, so therefore you are not going home today. And I'm like, what? Up the door, 
visited me, handcuffs on, took me into a holding cell, um, checked me. Uh, that night, I was put in uh, Orange County Jail. And I said, that was the first real shock when they took me there because I was like, there was, I never been handcuffs before. Like handcuffs around my, my hands and then a chains around my hip and the handcuffs was there, chains around my, my legs and the shoe leases taken off. So I could not use them as a weapon. And there I was dragged away and it's very difficult to walk without, with open sh shoes and without shoe leases mm -hmm. and then handcuffs and foot chains and and one night in Orange County Jail and that, that was that was scary that was really a new world for me and then I went back to Homeland Security office and then the day after they took me to um, ICE immigration center um, and there was two options there was Miami or Bakersfield with Jack near Jacksonville or near Jacksonville Baker, uh, Baker County, sorry. And they took me to the county and I, I have no idea what to imagine. I, I, I thought, okay, detention center is not like a real jail. It's maybe better, but this was, this was bad. Like I was taken there and nothing was told me. Like, like nothing makes sense. And I came into a very old wear out jail and the first thing that was put me in isolation. Uh, and I was I, I was put into a, a cell. I, I don't know if people can see, but eight times 13 feet. And, and there's a picture. This is like my cell. I was put in with bond bags on one side and then a shower and then a toilet. Mm. Leftover, underwear, garbage, mold on the ceiling. And there I was and the door was locked behind me. And uh, I would say that was the first time I really broke. I cried. I was like, what is happening? Like, 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 what is happening here? And, and very short, it was 10 days there. Then I would put in another, another dorm with, with murders and people. And uh, one cellmate, he had killed a homeless guy. Another guy had stabbed somebody in the knife. Those people have been in jail for... 20, 25 years there, and there, the first time I came in, it was almost started a fight because I wanted to call my wife, and then I found out people start to shout and yell, and 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 and, and it, the whole dorm went crazy. And like, what is happening? Because I was using the black phone, and I was not okay. Sorry, I did not know it was a black phone. No, you're not allowed to use the black phone. And the other phone was the, for the Hispanic people. So there was two phones, one for the black and one for the Spanish people. And there I stood as, as a white guy and like have no idea what happened. And after a month there, I was then put in another cell for a year. Uh, so it was uh, 412 days all in all. And, mm. and it was actually really when I came out, I understood why I was in. <laughs> It, it actually, I never really understood it while I was in because um, the papers I got make no sense. The, it was, it started with human, I started with weapon smuggling, then it became human trafficking. Then I was put up at economic fraud. Then there was no option for bond. Uh, like other people, other people came in, they came out on a bond. I could not come out on a bond because I was a security risk, because <sighs> I was a national threat. <sighs> so somehow I was put in a totally different category with everyone else. I saw people coming in and get a bond and going out for things they've done wrong, but I was a security risk, a national threat with no really option of bond. Extraordinary. Because of, yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, it, it was a journey. Friends, Acts 24, accusations are brought against Paul, and, and he's accused of being a pestilence. And remember, the, the believers in different cities are accused of turning the world upside down. Here, these crazy false charges against Torben. And again, I'm, I'm interacting with attorneys and finding out what's... And, and why is he still in jail? Why is he still in jail? 412 days here on American soil. Much more to come, stay right here. 
Hey, friends, Dr. Michael Brown here. Do you remember when people thought I was crazy when I said it's not too late for America, that God can still do something in our country, that there is going to be a pushback, a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution? And do you remember when people thought that you were crazy because you felt the same way, because you believed what I was saying and already felt it in your heart? Well, friends, that pushback is here. The, the gospel-based moral and cultural revolution we've been talking about for 25 years is unfolding, and we are right in the thick of it. And the line of fire broadcast is divinely positioned for such a time as this. Friends, you would be so gratified and blessed as, as, as I hear, if you could hear what I hear, testimony after testimony as leaders, young people, old people, moms, dads, students, people from all backgrounds come up to me and say, Dr. Brown, you're providing a template for us. You're providing a blueprint for us. You're showing us how to do this, how to have hearts of compassion, backbones of steel. But friends, it's a joint effort. We do this together. And with your support, we can amplify this broadcast around the nation and amplify this voice to shake the nation. Join our support team today. Become a torchbearer with a dollar or more per day. Here's the number to call to sign up, 800-538-5275. That's 800 800- 538-5275 or go to askdrbrown.org askdrbrown.org and become a monthly supporter. Click on Donate Monthly Support. I want to immediately give you two classic books, Compassionate Father or Consuming Fire, Who is the God of the Old Testament and Revolution, which will really show you what it means to be a Jesus follower today. Plus, you get free access to our online classes and so much more. Sign up today, askdrbrown.org. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Friends, we're on the front lines together. I want to encourage you to join our support team. A dollar or more per day makes you a torchbearer. You literally hold our arms up on the front lines, but not just that. We are equipping together. You are joining with us as we equip God's army in America and around the world. Again, we don't fight the way the world fights. We fight with spiritual weapons. We overcome evil with good. We overcome hatred with love. We overcome lies with truth. But be assured there will be opposition. Be assured that if we are dangerous to the kingdom of darkness, there will be pushback. And in the days ahead, we will be deleting all kinds of lies and false accusations against Torben right on our YouTube channel. And, and friends, I testified on his behalf in court. I, we talked about, it was by Zoom, talked about the spiritual climate in Denmark, talked about some real religious opposition laws, different things like that. I get, painted a larger picture of what's happening in Scandinavian countries, etc. And I, I could see, so I see the courtroom, and there's Torben in his in his orange jumpsuit and chains. I mean, this is this is not we're not just talking theory here or or you know stories. This is reality. What he lived through. So, so Torben, here's what I want to do for the rest of the broadcast. I want to take this segment and talk about what was happening, why the opposition, and then I want to take the last segment to talk about what the Lord did in your life. In prison, and remember, sometimes you're in complete isolation. Then with these dangerous, violent inmates, and then with mainly Spanish speakers, uh, and so it's, it's you're alone a lot of times. So we'll come to that. But yeah. so, what did you learn? What was actually happening? Why did this attack come? Spiritually, we understand, but what else was going on? Yeah, um, I would say it was very difficult for me to get information in the beginning. Um, I knew. I knew nothing makes sense of the papers I got, and 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 I fear God. Like I have a high high fear of God, and I've been trying to live in the light, really, and and done everything correct. So I knew there was like nothing wrong in that sense. I got a paper after um, maybe ten months from one of the lawyers, and and it was actually a paper. I sit it with it here in my hand, and and. I really I needed to read this many times, and and it really make a little more sense. It, it was about actually an investigation we uh, acquired for the ICE officer who detained me, the guy who arrested me in the beginning, because one of the things that's written on this paper was that we now got a witness statement 
who support that in September of 2022, that is actually, uh, I got detained in, in July. So that is three months or two and a half months after I got detained. This officer, he contacted a civilian on the outside and said to him that they should go to Homeland Security and falsely accu accuse me of human trafficking. So the whole human trafficking thing that suddenly was on my records, on my papers, according to this witness we have, who on the O have testified, it came from that officer who detained me. So try to imagine this. I got detained by officer, and two months after I was detained, he tried to start a criminal investigation against me by falsely accuse me of human trafficking. Mm. And that also did that people who tried to help me, we know there was some uh, senator or other people who tried to come into the case in the beginning. They saw my records, my file, and everyone who saw, hey, he's been investigated by FBI for human trafficking. What do people do? Hands up. We don't know this guy. We don't want to toss it. Mm. And, 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 and it was scary to understand that those people who actually put me in jail <laughs> was actually behind most of the lies. And on this paper, there's so many things he did that is just that show he had a personal agenda to get rid of me. And, and what we know, we found out later, is that he was connected with accusers from Denmark. So I actually fled Denmark to come away from this. And, and one of the guys who was behind some of the lies in Denmark, he actually sent me an email when I came to America and he said, finally, you will come to America. So now I can destroy you and I will get you to jail because I have contacts in Washington. And I got that email. And, you know, I didn't put more into it because, you know, yeah. people can bring yep. lies. But but that was the main reason yeah. that that the accusers from Denmark, people who was part of government and work with, with different things in Europe, w had a hand in all of this. And and. And that was scary, and I want to say it was, it was very intimidated to be in there because my treatment was different. Um, for example, my officer who came to my, my ICE officer inside the jail, he, uh, when he came with paper, he wanted me to sign papers. And, and it was like, I said again and again, I need my lawyer to look at it first, and he got irritated every time. Mm. And at and, and one time I said, have you sent it to my lawyer? And one time he said, no, I've been told I'm not allowed to talk to your lawyer. So he had been dictated from higher up that he was not allowed to speak to my lawyer. And mm. one of the most scary moments was actually two weeks before I got detained, it got the free. Um, I, was, I was called in to a room with two ICE officers where one recorded on a video I was put on a chair and I was given papers. And it was papers if I don't copy, if I don't give them everything they provide. And there was a lot of things, things I did not understand, like with numbers and things. If I don't do this and this and this, I can be federal prosecutor and I can go to jail up to 10 years. Mm. And he gave me that paper and he was irritated and he wanted me to sign. And I've been told, don't sign anything before I talk to my lawyer. And I said, hey, I cannot sign. I need to talk to my lawyer. And he was angry. You need to sign. And said, I, I have a lawyer call in two hours. Give me three hours. Just be back in three hours. I have a lawyer call in two hours. It's not on your timeline. It's not on your timeline. It's our, our timeline. You need to sign right now. And, and I, I couldn't sign it. And then he said, so you are going to remain here and I'm going, we are going to federal prosecute you. Mm. And I was like, what is going on here? And then he lied to my face and said that I've said something to my lawyer I haven't said. And there was the people who, who had me in there. 
And and I had it is sort of the the other people in, in in my dorm who came to me like, what is going on, Tom? And I actually ended up being the dorm as long that anyone else. Like in my, I was moved to another dorm with 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 uh, mainly people from uh, Mexico and Honduras and so on. And most people was only there three four months, but I was there like thirteen months. So I was there longer than anyone else. Mm. And and it, it was it was scary and and I would say the greatest gift I got was on my second birthday in jail, where we actually gave out a video with um, Congressman Chairman uh, uh, Clay Higgins from Louisiana, who actually stood up in the government in the uh, parliament, what is called in America, in the Congress in America and said that we believe that uh, Tom is being persecuted by this administration because he's an immigrant Christian. And finally, I was like, finally, <laughs> finally, somebody stand up and put words on it because I think the hardest in the beginning is that I, I heard a saying was, no one is in jail unless they've done something wrong. And, and, and I had, like, most people thought, okay, Tom, he's not doing human trafficking. That, that is too insane. And weapon smuggling, that is too much. But he must have done something wrong because no one, I've heard that so many times, yeah, yeah. no one is in jail innocent. And, and when I hear people come with a statement like no one, I, like I can come with one person. Let's talk about Christ. I can come with many other. Let's talk about Peter, Potter, James. Let's talk about the early disciples. Let's talk about the early believers. Let's talk about Christians all over the world. Yes. Like there is thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who is in jail because of their faith. Yes. But we are not used to it in America. We are not used to this level of persecution in the West. And 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 it, it, it go back to the beginning. God sent me to America also saying... Make my people ready for because America is not ready for what is coming, and and I became even yeah. like symbol. Of that. Right, yeah. God, God say, here's how we get the message out more loudly than yeah. your words. You're going to experience it and live it out. And listen, friends, I am privy to documents that the lawyers have. I, I'm privy to information. I've been sent copies of of things. Uh, there is there there are ongoing cases going on. There is there is a an anti-defamation case going on right now where, where Torben has been defamed by someone that said, I'm talking about serious enough to go to court. Ongoing issues that the lawyers are trying to work through with the government of the United States. And as crazy as it sounds, let me just say this, there's also a climate where there are Christians, some of the very sincere, who are so concerned that there's this group, these Christians trying to take over and do this and do that. They're Pentecostal, they're charismatic, and they're going to take over everything. It's a fear-mongering thing that creates an environment. Mm. That fed into this as well. I'm not giving you more details. That fed into it as well. So, so friends, I want you to help get this message out. I, I meant to mention this at the beginning, but I was so focused on, on talking with my friend Torben and getting this out. But everybody watching on YouTube right now, if you haven't clicked the thumbs up, do that, and then share it. Everyone watching on Facebook, click like there and share it. Those that will hear this subsequent to the live broadcast on podcast, share it with your friend. Tell everybody you've got to tune in and listen to this. Everybody listening live on radio when the show is over, tell your friends about this. This is real life. You know, I remember, Torben, once I was ministering in Korea, and I was speaking 25 times in one week, and at the end of the mm. first morning sessions, I said to everyone, the Lord's speaking to some of you, skip lunch, you need to fast and pray for breakthrough. And I heard the Lord say to me, what a wonderful idea. And I thought, I said, no, 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 Lord, that was for everybody else. That was for everybody else, because I have to minister day and night. It's like, no, no, that's a great idea. You skip lunch as well. So here you come in, irony of ironies, America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, the, the land of yeah. opportunities, the land where people come from around the world. For, for religious asylum and freedom from tyrannical governments and all of that. And you come here and you end up going through something utterly unique, 412 days in prison. He's out of prison now. Pray for justice. Pray for the truth to come to light. When we come back, let's talk about what Jesus did in Torben's life in prison for those 412 days. We'll be right back.
This is Michael Ellison, founder of Tribeta Wellness. I want you to hear an amazing testimony from my friend, James Robison, and most all of you will know of him. He and his wife, Betty, host the Life Today television program. Now, here is James. Let me tell you about a miracle I experienced. My friend, Michael Ellison, he and his wife are our 40-year-plus best friends. Well, let me just say this to you. I had so much pain with what was called tennis elbow that I could hardly reach over and pick up the phone without pain, without it hurting me. I couldn't pick up something to drink, a glass of tea or anything. It was very difficult to do anything without wearing a tight strap. And then Michael shared the Nopal cactus juice with me, Nopalea. I began drinking about that much in the morning in a glass and that much later in the day. And in three months, I was a different person. I have now gone more than 10 years with no pain. Not better, well, I have no joint pain. I am telling you, it did something to the inflammation in my body that was undeniable. Now, that's just my testimony. But that's been more than 10 years with no pain. Matter of fact, if I miss for some foolish reason a few days, I can feel it creeping back that fast. So give it a try. See if it helps relieve your pain. I hope it does like it has mine because it worked for me. No Pelea is supported by clinical studies for lowering inflammation and improving mobility, flexibility, and range of motion in the neck, back, and joints for less reliance on pain medication and improved quality of life. Call 800-771-5584 and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order goes to support the line of fire. Call 800-771-5584 or go online to Trivita.com. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, we've got just a few minutes left with Torben Sundergaard. Again, uh, we will be deleting waves of false attacks coming against our brother. It's just the nature of being on the front lines but when you stir things up, I've talked to you about wanting to be dangerous to the kingdom of darkness and on Satan's hit list in that regard, that the enemy knows who I am and what I'm doing. And the more I get falsely accused and attacked and lied about, the more encouraging it is, hey, we're making a difference. Not because we're obnoxious, not because we're foolhardy, not because we're self-righteous, not because we're hypocritical, but because we're on the front lines, there will be opposition. So Torben separated from his family all this time. It's very difficult for everyone, as you can imagine. Please pray for the entire family. Pray for justice in these court cases. Pray for the truth to come to light. And may each of you mm. be strengthened as you stand on the front lines, because often the hardest thing is not being in public ministry. It's just living for Jesus day by day in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in the schools. Many times that's, that's the most difficult when you're just rejected by friends or peers or put out. May God give you courage to stand. Uh, Torben, we, we've had some, some great talks, which there could be more, but we've had some great talks yeah. since you came out of prison. Uh, what are some of the highlights of what the Lord did in you? You've talked honestly about breaking, obviously the fear, yeah. the isolation. When I was arrested in, in Israel for allegedly starting trouble, and of course nothing, you know, I, I left after hours with them saying you didn't do anything. But even there, just those hours, even though knowing mm -hmm. the worst case scenario is are going to spend the night in jail, there's a sudden feeling of powerlessness and you can't communicate with the outside world. So I, it's just the tiniest glimpse of what you must have gone through. But tell us some of what mm -hmm. God did in your life in prison. Yeah, now that there were seasons because uh, <laughs> it, it was more than a year, um, I would say the first 10 days of isolation, I, I, I the first three, four days was trauma. It was shocking. It, it was really scary. I had nothing, like no no phone, no paper, no Bible, nothing. And and somebody actually sent me a Bible. And and I, I was like, I've never kissed a Bible like that before. <laughs> I was I was hugging it, I was kissing it, I was like just to be a place without anything, that, that was special. And and then I, I just start to read the Bible and, and I had actually beautiful moments in there uh, where I, I I felt like some of the house church people in China. It, it was very special moment. 
Then I was put to the first storm I was in. Um, that that was scary. That was that was really scary to be around other people, and 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 I was not ready for it. I, I just want to say I'm. I tried to excuse me before, but how, how do you prepare for something like that? Uh, at that time, I I, I was depressed. I, I felt I was depressed. I was I was not doing good. Um, but then God spoke to me. I, I got a very powerful dream that that really uh, spoke a lot to me and 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 about God's plan in it and God's hand in it and mm. and and to start to see, okay, God have a plan and a purpose and and you know, I, I've I've read a lot. I study a lot. I, I read about the heavenly man and brother Young and his his some of his books and yeah, the house yeah. just, uh, and persecution in China. But but it's it's one thing to read about it, something else to suddenly be there. And and I want to say it's it's, it's more scary to be there than to read about it. Um, and and I, it was hard. Um, then I did a fast, a, a long fast, um, uh, where I I um, I lost a lot of weight and and really start to okay, God, I need to focus on you. I I need to survive this. You, you need to do something. And 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 then things start to slowly turn. It was not like overnight, but uh-huh. I was studying the word about persecution and suffering and, and God's plan and, and 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 you see again and again how suffering is part of our journey, is part of our life and and, and I studied Paul and, and saw his heart in it and and how he could live the life he lived and, and, and without fear because I felt fear. I really felt fear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 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 it started to grow in me slowly and, and I started to have moments where I felt a little freedom, but then it disappeared again. A little freedom then it disappeared. Then at one time I, I got start to me talk to me about studying the k- kingdom. The Gospel of the Kingdom, and I actually ended up writing a book. I have a book here, three hundred pages, <laughs> handwritten, book, wow. written on a secure with security pin like this. This is a small pin I can bend, so I don't hurt anyone. Uh huh. Amazing. Used maybe 30, thirty pins, and and the more I came in to focus on on the kingdom to come, of the return of Christ, of of the heavenly Jerusalem, and and the reward. The more, the more this life felt, this pain felt less painful, and 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 I start to really see that God, this was part of God blessing me. The Bible says I'm blessed when I'm being persecuted. I'm blessed when they lie, they yeah, lie all yeah. kind of evil against me, and and there was moments in there where I actually rejoiced. There was moments where I was like, Hallelujah, God, thank you for this. Like, thank you for allow me to be here right now and, and take part of this suffering. And, and it, it was really beautiful. Then I had a moment of revival in there where God just came. It, it was very, very special. I was trying to share the gospel. I was trying to get things up running and it just didn't work. It didn't work. And I was trying again and again and again. But it was like one afternoon I was laying in my cell and, and suddenly it became quiet outside. And, and, and I went outside and something was going on. Suddenly the TV was off and everyone was standing, standing in a circle and praying for somebody. I'm like, what is happening here? And it was somebody who had just lost his mom. And it was like, God said, now is your moment, Tom. And I was like, God, I don't want to. <laughs> like, it's, I tried, but they don't want to. Now is your moment. So I went down and, and got somebody to turbo for me. And then I started to speak to people. And it was like a changed heaven. And I started to do meeting every day there. <laughs> and, and people start to meet God. People start to get dreams, uh, come to my cell, got deliverance. Like one guy, he, he got a dream, a uh, very bad dream, three times the same morning. And then he came to my cell and got delivered. And from that moment on, he was just worshiping God and every day. And the worship was going to the pies, uh, to the toilet, to the air conditions. So you can hear worship. Then another guy got baptized uh, free. Another guy got baptized uh, free. Another guy. And every time somebody got born again, we, we took them down and shared the testimony for everyone in the dorm. And, and, uh, and then we started to do Bible study groups. And out of 25 
people in my dorm, there was 22 who joined Bible wow. studies. Praise every God. Day. In three different, I had three disciples uh, who got born again. I baptized water, Holy Spirit, and I discipled them. I did not speak Spanish, so I discipled them during the day. And then they did Bible study groups in Spanish with a teacher in the afternoon. And, and just one story, there was one guy, um, one of my strongest disciples, he beautiful, beautiful Baptist and pouring water over his head. That was what we could do, lay hands on him. Then he went in and took a shower and got filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was very strong. Uh, two months later, he was in a, in a discussion with, with the ice officer and he was put in a box. He was taken to holding. Um, and that is hard to be there. And he was there for a week thinking, oh, no, what now? I don't hope he's lost his faith in all of this. Yeah, yeah. But then I met him uh, a, a few weeks later when we were outside one day at rec, and I saw him, and he came, I was like, hey, Barker, how are you? And he came running to me. Tom, it's so amazing. I'm just like you now. I'm sitting in my cell. I don't see TV anymore. I'm praying. I'm reading the Bible. I'm starting a Bible discovery group in my cell, and the first disciple I'm getting baptized tonight. Praise God. And, 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 and it was so beautiful. Later, another guy came to me from another dorm who got transferred it over to me and I asked him hey what are you a Christian and he started to say yeah in our dorm we actually do in Bible discovery groups there is a Bible there is a missionary one place in this jail who had done teaching he's being copied and doing in different places and I Amazing. said this is me and he was like this is you so I know at least of three dorms uh, where they were doing Bible discovery group Bible studies and, and people got born again and, and set free and and, and there was, it was powerful. And I want to say that the most powerful communion I ever had was there on the prison floor. The most powerful baptism I ever had was in there. And, and some of the most powerful studies I've had was in there because, you know, most of the New Testament is written in prison. So when you read it in prison, it just, the context just make it more deep in a way where yeah. you read the words and like, whoa, I understand. Yeah. I understand. So I want to say I learned a lot. I learned so much. And, and today I'm thankful I was not out after a month or two because then I would come out full of fear, full of anxiety and say to everyone out there, stop what you're doing and be afraid. Yeah. But instead I can come out and say, there's something we need to learn at the body because come on, most people are not ready for it. I was not ready for it. I'm come not on. like... I, and I would say that 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 was the greatest and the thing and and another thing is is and I want to repent there public because sorry um, you you really feel alone um, and I think that feeling of being so alone. Uh, that, that was really hard, and I did not understand why the body was so quiet. And, and you, Dr. Brown, I will always love you. you. You said something, but but many people did not say anything. And, and I really understand we need each other. Yeah. And, and I need the body more than I had been been showing. And, and I want to repent there. And and, I, and and my brother, and, and we need to love each other. And my yeah. brother, that's that's where we have to end with those words, yeah. spread this message.